I'm out of order? You're out of order. This whole unordered collection is out of order. I'm Ray Myers. Welcome to Craft vs. Cruft. And I happen to see a, uh, a meme that I see every once in a while, uh, which is Terrence Howard trying to expose that one times one does not actually equal one. And I, I saw it from kind of a new perspective because it is 2024, the year of formal methods, actually coming to a close soon. Got an amazing finale lined up for you. Very excited about it. And what can kind of be a productive game when you see something that you disagree with strongly, perhaps you even think it's like obvious why it's wrong, is to try and get yourself to be able to carefully explain why that is. Now, I'm not going to be fixated on uh, Terrence Howard's entire backstory here. He is a talented and famous actor who for some reason has decided to declare that all of math and physics is wrong. Um, Plenty of people have discussed that in great depth. He's even had a conversation with Neil deGrasse Tyson. The interesting kind of social phenomenon of crackpot theorists, I think is covered very well by Dr. Angela Collier in her video, Crackpot Physicist. I'm not gonna flesh all that out better than it's already been discussed. I'd like to use this as a vehicle to give you something to walk away with, uh, a tool that you can use when you are discussing uh, controversial points of view that you or someone else has is basically the notion of being prepared to define your terms. So let's look just briefly at this unbalanced equation argument intending to prove that one times one doesn't equal one, but actually equals two. Now, the thing is, you can define an algebra where one times one equals two. Trivially, I could just say it's one where multiplication is actually what we think of as addition, or maybe numbers mean something completely different, but we haven't discussed what the definitions of any of these terms are. If you've got a controversial view on something, you should be prepared to define what the concepts in play actually mean to you. Now, in an interview, he says, multiplication is supposed to mean adding something. Multiplying means adding. That's kind of true in English a lot of the time. For instance, uh, the phrase, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth in uh, the book of Genesis, which in my NIV copy says, be fruitful and increase in number, actually, because they're kind of back and forth about like, is the better translation of this uh, word in the original Hebrew, let's say, is it multiply, is it increase in number? In casual speech, that isn't really a distinction we're concerned about. Another example that comes up in Dr. Eugenia Cheng's great book, The Art of Logic, is the way we use or in the English language as opposed to in formal logic. Oftentimes we mean like an exclusive or. If you say, are you gonna go to work today or stay home? You're not saying, are you gonna go to work or stay home or are you gonna do both? It's exclusive, but then sometimes you might say, uh, would you like peanut butter or jelly on your sandwich? And it's understood from context. The answer might well be both. And that's not really a problem with English in my opinion. That's just how natural language works and it works well enough for its job. In formal logic, we have to differentiate between an exclusive or and an inclusive or and have actually separate symbols for them. The needs are just different. So by the same token, multiply as used in casual speech means just sort of several different things interchangeably and none of them actually correspond exactly to what multiplication means in a mathematical equation, which could be any number of things depending on even on what we're multiplying. You can multiply matrices together. Did you know that? In mathematics, multiplication is usually a binary operator, right? You, you can't just say the number four multiplied. It can't do it by itself. But in casual speech, you're able to use it as a unary operator and just say that the quantity of something multiplied. And we know what you mean. It's just fine. So I challenge not Terrence Howard. I challenge you. If you needed to prove that one times one actually does equal one, how would you do it? And keep in mind, you might be talking to someone who doesn't know what your definition of multiplication is. Maybe they don't even know what your definition of numbers is. That sounds far-fetched, but I see people discuss concepts all the time uh, in essentially the same way that we're looking at here. And like, I would never do that. You do it all the time. 
Or if you don't, people around you do. So to illustrate how you can make an argument for first principles, today I'm gonna to demonstrate why one times one does in fact equal one using definitions that I'm willing to completely supply. We're going to formalize this in the Lean Theorem Prover, but I'm not going to rely on its notion of what a natural number is. That would be cheating. I'm just gonna define it almost out of air, out of just the idea that you can define data types. And nothing that I'm gonna do is going to really rely on the fact that we're running in a theorem prover. That's just gonna check my work. You can do this on pencil and paper. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna declare a namespace called, let's say, my nat. And that's going to get me out of a space where I'm going to conflict with any built-in data types with the same name. Uh, which is important because the very next thing I'm going to do is define nat, the natural numbers. So I'm going to define an inductive data type. You might not know all these language keywords as we go. It'll hopefully be clear from context. And it's going to be called nat. And it can be one of only two things. It, it may seem there's an infinite number of natural numbers. We're going to start with zero per ISO standard. It's actually pretty cool that I can just define two things and I'm going to get an infinite number out of them. So just you wait, right? So um, a natural number can be zero. I don't have to prove that. Lean doesn't know what this zero is. I'm just stating it, right? This is a definition. There can be something, I'm calling it zero, could call it dog if I wanted to. Now, and that can be one other thing as well. It can be the successor of a nat which we'll call n, but nat is the type. So given that, now we can start at zero, we can count forever. So that's great. And just one more piece of, of boilerplate here. I'm gonna say defining a representation so that we can print these out, that'll be more convenient. And so that I don't have to say nat zero every time that I refer to this, I'm going to do open nat. So now I should be able to eval zero and see over on the right hand side that I've got a zero. Okay, excellent. Just for convenience, again, let me uh, define a few of these for uh, future reference. I'm gonna call it one. It's not a special kind of thing. This is just kind of a shorthand. Uh, the successor of zero is what I'm going to say one and mean later. And the successor of one, can you guess what I'm gonna do here? is two and you know that's really all we need but hey let's go nuts let's let's make a three great so now i've defined numbers or at least natural numbers so now i can define addition what really is addition you might not think about that on a regular basis but again for our purposes we're going to supply one potential foundation for what addition is it is a function that takes two arguments. Both of them are natural numbers. We'll call them A and B. And it's gonna also return a natural number. So what's the definition of that function? There are only, again, two cases we need to be concerned with. So we're gonna use a match statement on A and B. Consider the case where A is zero. In that case, zero plus B, I'm gonna say is B. I don't need to prove that this is my definition of addition. Remember, this is a foundation. The only other thing that A could be, given that it's a natural, is that it is the successor of another number. Let's call it A prev, just to, to be clear. And I'm gonna define that result to be the successor of add A prev, and B. If you think about that for a while, you should be able to understand why that corresponds to your idea of addition. Let's try it out. Eval add zero, zero. That's zero, okay, that's, that's good, that's what we expect. Add zero and one. We're gonna have to read this by counting. Zero, one, okay, zero plus one is one and let's add one plus one just for good measure. One plus one is zero, one, two. Okay, great, one plus one equals two. Let us accept this as our definition of addition and proceed to define multiplication. Again, it is a function that takes two natural numbers. 
which we will again call A and B, and it returns a natural number. And I'm going to match on the two arguments. So again, two cases, right? Uh, A might be zero. Now, what should we return if A is zero? And again, I don't have to prove what the result is. This is a definition. I am defining zero times any number to be zero. The only other case I'll need to handle is that the first argument is the successor of some number. If it's not zero, that's what it must be. So that one's a little more subtle. I'm going to add B to multiply, to get the product of A prev. So we're calling this recursively, and since we're decreasing, the first argument every time will eventually hit zero and return. If that wasn't gonna happen, incidentally, or if we hadn't handled all possible cases, Lean would have rejected this. That would have been a compiler error in this case. Great, so we provided a definition for multiplication. Let's see how it behaves. We will multiply zero by zero. We get zero. We're gonna multiply zero by one. Again, we get zero. Let's multiply even two by two. Well, let's get even crazier, two by three, right? Okay, so that is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, great, two times three is six. And now, um, final boss here. What's one times one? I, I, my whole world could fall down right here. I don't know, you know. Maybe this is where the Illuminati stops the recording. Let, let, let's see, zero, one. Okay, great, so we have a pretty clear foundation for natural numbers, which is called piano arithmetic. They can show from first principles why the various basic facts you're made to memorize in, in early grades actually do make sense. The foundation is a little different for things like integers, rational numbers, but it can be done. It's all out there. If you're interested in mathematical foundations, that's great. You, you, you should be. And you can define your other spaces with other rules. There are many different algebras. Some of them don't behave the same way. But if you find yourself just disagreeing with something because, well, everyone knows this, or I learned that in school, I half remember, or, or whatever, you can use that as a, just a convenient vehicle for examining the trail of, of derivation that leads to it. And, and again, if you're going to get out there in the world and try to influence people's point of view, be prepared to define your terms. If you'd like to play more with the Lean Theorem Prover, I recommend the Natural Numbers game. You can play it online, it's really cool. And for provers in computer science in general, there's a great book series called Software Foundations that actually starts the same way. Let's define natural numbers, then let's prove associativity and commutivity, and then eventually they're building programming languages and stuff, it's really cool. Well, until next time, comment and subscribe if you'd like to see more. And as Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, with patience, the most tangled cord may be undone. Thank you.